Hello and welcome to Johnny Ross Fractional CMO. We, I hope you're well. We are live on LinkedIn. We're live on Facebook. We are live on YouTube. You may be listening on the podcast. Thanks for being here and being such a great listener. Today, I am so pleased to say that I've got Brooke Janasek with me from Los Angeles. How are you, Brooke? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks for joining me. Thank uh, you for having me. You're you're the uh, founder and CEO of the Grow CMO. Tell us more about the Grow CMO. Yeah, well, it is a fractional leadership solution for effective marketing. So I'm essentially a fractional CMO for businesses who are looking to uh, have strategic leadership in their marketing departments. And we're going to talk about why you should fail fast and early today. We're also going to mm-hmm. step into uh all sorts of different topics around how to be clear on your message. Um, we're going to talk about performance marketing versus brand. We're going to talk about how to stick to the basics, get to know your customers um, and focus on the outcomes. So there's lots mm-hmm. of different topics we're going to step into. But one of the one of the, the biggest things that this podcast is about is how to learn, how to mm-hmm. how, failing fast. And, and, you know, from my understanding, you've got a really memorable <laughs> big fail. Uh, so yeah. I would like to hear about it. It was when, was it w- at one of your first ad agencies? It, yes, it, it, it was um, 20 years ago. So if I'm dating myself there and give me a pass <laughs> for uh, some of my references that will be coming. But um, yeah, I was uh, my first job out of grad school at an ad agency and I was I was feeling good. I was very excited to be at this agency and had a really big client that um, had decided to sponsor one of the university athletic teams in the area. And at the time, the team was very popular. Uh, Lots, thousands and thousands of people attended the games. And one of our ideas was during this weekend to sponsor the series and to provide something of use to the fans. So we've all been in those situations where the client wants to give out swag and they want to give out, you know, beer koozies or something with their logo on it. And we thought, okay, let's do something that's useful, actually useful that the fans could use. So we had this brilliant idea that because it was a weekend in May, that these families are going to be attending the baseball game and why not provide them with something like sunscreen? So, right, that seems like a a pretty safe, uh, (laughs) pretty safe giveaway, right? It's a great idea. And so we went back and forth with the client on what we were going to say on the packets of sunscreen. And our copywriters came up with, you know, really clever lines and the client pushed back quite a bit. And we ended up with a line that said, uh, protect your skin like we protect your assets. So again, pretty harmless. It seems like it would fit the 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 bill, and uh, we're getting you know clever in some wordplay, but okay. And the weekend, you know, it's the week of the the series, and I arrive at work um, fairly early in the morning, and I walk in, and my desk is filled. Like I'm I'm talking like the entire desk covered in condoms, and I. Th- I thought somebody was playing a joke on me and I thought, okay, funny what, you know, and I'm looking at them and my eye caught the word protect and I thought, oh my gosh. And I looked at them and they were the packets of sunscreen that we are supposed to hand out to 30,000 people at a, not even just a baseball weekend series, but mother's day weekend baseball series. (laughs) Mother's Day. (laughs) So, so, you know, this is just, insanely funny. And I am mortified. And I thought, how did this happen? And the next thing I knew is I, t- I said to uh, my boss, I said, we can't, we can't hand these out. And I said, they look like condoms. And he's like, eh, it's not so bad. And then, you know, people are coming into my office laughing. So we knew that we had, <laughs> we had an issue on our hands. And so I needed to, as a young individual, I needed to call the client, you know, this was my first oops of, of my career. And my, uh, uh, boss said, I'm not going to bail you out. You know, this is a chance for you to learn. And I want you to call them and and talk through what happened. And what happened was I didn't see a proof and that is on me. That was a mistake that I learned early on in my career that, um, I approved a proof on paper, but I didn't get an actual sample 
of the sunscreen. And had I done that, I would have seen very clearly. I mean, it was a square foil packet. Like it, there's no mistaking what it was, it, you know, could have been. And so that was something I learned early on, but we turned it into a really great uh, PR opportunity for the client. So the client did say, yes, no, we're, we're not going to hand these out. There's <laughs> too much risk here, but I ended up calling like every single dermatology office in the city asking if they wanted this for donations. And there was also a Cinco de Mayo parade coming up um, that we said, you know, we could donate some of it to. Um, so it, it ended up working out. But um, like I said, the lesson learned was I didn't get the sample in time to, to approve it. So that was on me. And it was a costly mistake um, that the agency had to had to pay for. Well, I mean, yeah, what what a mistake that is, and and it's you know a potential PR disaster, isn't it? Uh, and I, but I also like how you turned it into giving mm-hmm. to charity and and actually getting mm-hmm. use out of the product. Mm-hmm. You you nowadays you're working with um, big organisations. Typically, mm-hmm. you know, it might be uh, integrated marketing departments. You know, maybe a CEO or president's brought you into that. Mm-hmm. And I guess one of my questions is. How do you, you, we're saying here, you know, why sh- you should fail fast and early. Mm-hmm. How can you actually go out there to say, right, my objective here is to fail. <laughs> how do you, how do you uh, create an environment mm-hmm. where there is potential for failure and how do you mm-hmm. embrace that? And, and why is it so important to, to, to fail so that, you know, well, yeah, why is it so important? Mm-hmm. Well, I think uh, some of the clients that I work with, honestly, are startups and the environment in itself, uh, you need to be able to fail fast and fail often because otherwise you're just going to get gobbled up and you're going to be behind the eight ball. And so I really encourage a lot of my clients who are startups that we need to take risks. Now is the time to kind of, and I'm not saying just a financial risk, but a risk with pushing the envelope if we're going to use a certain message or try something. Maybe we're going to um, diversify our revenue stream and we need to try this. There, there are opportunities there where you have to be kind of scrappy. And that's a prerequisite, honestly, in especially in being a startup to just kind of be able to create an environment where it's OK if we fail, but we're going to learn from that mistake and we're going to build upon it. That's kind of the, the important thing. And I know a lot of founders, there is a kind of this bucket of founders that are very risk adverse. And so they, they tend to recoil a little bit when I push And there's some that are like, yeah, let's go and let's go fast. And so it's kind of which, which camp do you fall into, but um, really important to, even as a leader, if you're an inside an organization that is more established to create an environment where it's okay and to give your team opportunities to fail almost like give them a little, some guardrails where, you know, it's okay if they fail, it's a safe environment so that they are able to learn from their mistakes and, and move forward and, and not a huge cost to the, to the business either. So it's, so it's also about giving some leeway. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about experimentation, trying mm-hmm. different things. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the idea of trying different messages. So mm-hmm. sort of going out for something quite bold and big and, mm-hmm. and trying that. Um, you, we were just talking in the green room, um, and I noticed that you're a, a CMO of a, a startup, which is Leash Pet Transportation. Yes. Um, and uh, this is an Uber for pets. It is. Just, just, tell it me, is. just tell me more about that. Yeah, Uber for pets is is exactly how we describe it to uh, individuals. So in the states, uh, Uber or any of the rideshare services, um, you have to the owner has to accompany the pet on the ride. So with Leash, we are driving pets to their appointments. So if they need to be to the vet, groomer, daycare, or boarding, we will take them. And we just launched an app in April. So you schedule the ride um, via your phone, and then the driver will come pick up your pet, take them to the vet, and then bring them back home. So it's been an incredible um, resource for busy individuals like me. I started out as a user before I became their CMO. And... um, it's a it's a lovely service that's very convenient and time saving for for individuals. You, you start out as a user. I'm guessing you've got a, a dog then. I do. I do. I have a, a border collie, and he is full of energy um, most most often. I don't know why he's <laughs> asleep right now. Usually, he's running around. 
we have a, a toy poodle that's often running oh, around the house. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, well, I'm just curious on that business. Is there anything that, you know, I don't know if you can talk about it, but is there mm -hmm. anything that, that sort of you've tried and failed so far? And also, I'm curious about what the long-term strategy is. Is there a big risk here that Uber's just going to copy it? Yeah, that's a great question and one that we talk about often, to be honest. Um, you know, we feel that it's a, a novel concept. And yes, they're the rovers of the world or Ubers of the world could come in and take the idea. Um, and that only fuels us to keep pushing faster and to, to innovate quicker. Um, and so we know that, you know, Rover, for example, or WAG, they um, have individuals that do the pet sitting, um, do the dog walking, things like that. And for them to offer this service, it would kind of take away from uh, maybe the pet daycares or the pet boarding facilities. And so what we're doing is we're really partnering with those businesses to say, hey, we're going to help you by, you know, these busy individuals might not be able to bring their pets to daycare three days a week. But now with our service, they can go five days a week. And with Rover and WAG, that's kind of a threat to those businesses. So, um, but yeah, I think that's the risk anytime you put an idea out there that someone bigger is going to take it and they have the, the resources to scale it more quickly. And we just can't operate in fear like that. We have to keep, you know, focused on what we're doing and know that we're offering a really good service. And if somebody wants to buy us, great. <laughs> well, I mean, I love the idea of a bolt-on for Rover. I'm very yeah. familiar with Rover as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I'm just imagining a click of a button how you could add uh, leash to your mm -hmm. uh, to, to your sitting uh, whatever. Um, uh, yeah, very clever. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so so <laughs> we're talking about um, uh, we're talking about why you should fail fast and early. And, mm -hmm. and Brooks just uh, talked about a, a fantastic uh, fail that she had very early <laughs> on in her career. Um, uh, nowadays, well, you, you talk. Uh, we were just talking then about uh, how it's important to fail and how it's important to sort of try different things. Performance marketing mm -hmm. is all about performance. It's, right. You know, that's, that's where that, that it's all about ROI. It's all about, you mm -hmm. know, the, the CFOs constantly focused on, you know, is it performing? How do you bring in failure into performance marketing is, is, you know, is, how does how does question. that how does that work? Yeah, that is a great question. So one of the things um, in my previous role that I was responsible for was generating leads for the entire franchise system, and there are you're absolutely right. the The CFO is looking at okay, what's our return on ad spend, and are the dollars being spent effectively? And the CEO was also very interested in have we hit our lead goals because this is how our franchisees. Mm -hmm eat essentially, literally and figuratively. So um, there is less room, I feel like for error, but how I always, and I was also coaching the franchisees, but how I set it up was if we have our budget, let's set 70% of our budget to things that we know are tried and true. We have the data to know that it has been working, that we're getting a good spend, return on our spend and it's generating leads at the allowable cost. But then let's you know set aside 20% for things that we want to try. So maybe it's something that we've heard other franchisors or other people in our industry have tried. We haven't tried it yet, um, but we're going to try it now. And then 10% was contingency. So I felt like, again, still creating a safe space to quote unquote fail, um, but it wasn't super risky because most of our money was invested in things that we knew were working. And so, for example, now, again, this is five, six years ago part of that 20% was allocated to Facebook because at the time, not a lot of people had ventured into that space yet for paid lead gen. And so we wanted to see, okay, how is this working? Well, it's a really low cost per lead. The conversion rates were totally there. Um, and then now that has changed. So um, even going back to the leash client, I'm very hesitant um, about TikTok still. I was about um, to bring up TikTok. Yeah, I was literally yeah. about to bring up TikTok. Yeah, I'm a little hesitant on it. I think um, it depends. This kind of gets into the brand versus performance marketing discussion. I think TikTok is a great awareness play. Um, and again, it depends on the brand and it depends on your objectives. So in order for people to book rides, we're still very regionally focused. And I just feel like TikTok goes to the masses. I don't know that that is a responsible or effective use of our dollars. 
when people in California could potentially see the video and we don't offer mm. the service there yet. So. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a really good point. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, building on that, you talked about how uh, brand versus performance marketing, mm -hmm. how do you find that uh, sweet spot? And in fact, I hear you talking about how they sort of need to be on the same team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do. I think a lot of people, if you look at really large organizations, they've separated their marketing teams into brand marketing and performance marketing. And um, one of my favorite uh, people that I've never met, but would love to meet someday, Jim Stengel. He has the CMO podcast and he talks about this quite a bit. And this is where I've learned a lot, but even through my career that they need to work together. And so again, when it comes to performance marketing or that lead gen piece, if you don't have a brand that has a strong presence or that people know who you are, what you stand for, understand your position, it's going to make it that much harder to generate the lead. So having all of the, you know, different um, stages of the funnel working together. And it's also really difficult to convince a, a leader of an organization to invest in brand marketing because they want something tangible. They want the result. They want to say, I can attribute the sale, the lead, the appointment, whatever it is to that particular ad. And brand awareness is, is that. It's awareness. It's like, how are we filling the funnel? How are we getting our name out there? How are we getting people to understand what we stand for? And that's harder to attribute to. And so I always challenge those individuals to think, are you willing to invest the time and money that it takes to build your brand? And do you have the patience for it? And do you understand that you can't just go out, try and do lead gen without some sort of information as to who we are and kind of priming the pump? So I think those two should work together and hand in hand. A strong brand is only going to help aid your performance marketing. Yeah, there, there is that constant battle. And you've got sort of head of brand really like, mm -hmm. you know, come on, we need to invest in this and mm -hmm. and, and that tug. And, and and you say in large, in large organizations, you get them these departments separate. But actually, I find in most organizations, there's just lots of lots of silo working. Mm -hmm. And, and you you know, you've got different teams trying to do different things. And, and actually, you just need joining up and there'd be mm -hmm. there'd just be so much better. Mm -hmm. Talking of which, mm -hmm. joining up and thinking about the customer. So mm -hmm you talk about getting clear on what the customer wants. Are we still in 2023, not focusing on the customer? Sometimes, uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, there are a lot of uh, companies that I've encountered that say, we know what our customer wants. And then I ask, okay, when's the last time you asked them? And it's been nine, 12 months. And to me, that's, that's a, that's a long time in the, the um, world of advertising and marketing and consumer insights, because our perceptions and our feelings and attitudes change about products all the time. We're influenced by so many different things, just from the accessibility that we have to news and social media. And so, yes, there are people that still think, okay, I, you know, every three years is probably a good amount of time for me to do some consumer research and every year you need to be, you know, staying on top of it or using something like a, an NPS, um, like a listen 360 or something like that for NPS. So you can get that real time, um, feedback so that you can see, okay, this is exactly what our consumers are asking for. And are we delivering upon that? But there's not always the desire and the, in uh, the, the belief yeah. that investing is a good idea in this. Right. It's, it's viewed as an expense. And yeah. so as marketers, we need to uh, still do our job of proving the value. Like, why are we doing this? Because if we just are guessing, we're, we might be spending more money just doing A-B testing than if we just went out and did a quick survey and asked. Um, and you don't have to have these intensive brand studies. Um, there's a time and place for those as well. But if it's just like we're going to market with something, let's just kind of pressure test it a little bit. There are so many ways to do that very quickly and effectively through polls, a quick email survey, doing a, a couple phone calls. You don't have to have this huge focus group um, to dive into. So I think that's what CEOs particularly think is it's going to be this $100,000 project. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 
Uh, we're live right now, and we've got comments coming in. Uh, I'm going to read a couple out. If you okay. are if you are listening or watching right now, uh, you're very welcome to ask Brooke a question. Uh, if you're on the podcast and listening afterwards, welcome. Thanks for listening. Uh, feel free to uh, tag us afterwards and ask questions. There'll be details in the show notes as well. But listen, thanks for being here. Uh, so Kent Huffman was talking about how have you ever tried uh, building a fail fast component into your marketing plan? I, I think you've sort of answered that with that percentage. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you'd, you'd add anything think to that yeah um, but no. I, I very much like the idea of the the percentage that you talked mm -hmm. about yeah no that's a, a great question Kent I appreciate it and I think um the other thing that I like to uh do too is tell like I don't care if I'm giving away any trade secrets here there's plenty of business to go around but I like to tell organizations like I can help you not make mistakes that you've made in the past. And so like, let's go through in the discovery process, what have you failed at before? So that we know, so we know how to adjust in the future. And so I think that transparency and 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 being a little honest about how I'm different than others do, does come into play. Uh, Robin talked about, uh, is there a benefit in using uh, platforms like TikTok? We, we've already talked about that to mm -hmm. grow more internationally, uh, even for a local platform, just to create mm -hmm. brand awareness in the event of expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. Yes. And that is part of our expansion plan. Um, knowing that we are currently uh, focused on the Midwest, we do um, have our sights on some new markets and TikTok 100% is um, part of that expansion plan. I think from a performance marketing standpoint to just go out and do that would not have been um, fiduciarily responsible for the client because we just didn't have the awareness yet. But yeah, that's she's absolutely right. That is a, a key component of awareness. Michelle Brigman on LinkedIn. She says, companies also tend to ask customers what they want to know mm -hmm. uh, versus asking customers what the brand needs to know. <laughs> uh, it's such a goldmine of information to help shape roadmap and experience design. Uh, is that what you find as well? Yeah, it's it's funny that she's completely right. Sometimes the once you've convinced leadership to get on board with some sort of um, customer experience survey, then they, the questions become very leading. It's like, no, 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 we don't want to lead the answer. Like we truly need to find out, is this going to be a viable product service? What is our objective? And let's not try and sway the, the answers too much because you can manipulate the questions in a way that you can get the answer that you want. <laughs> so um, tradition, let's talk about traditional marketing. And typically in traditional marketing, you'll have a persona, you're very much focused on uh, who mm -hmm. the uh, target audiences, all about them. Um, you talk about why focusing on the outcome is starting to eclipse that. Talk to me more about what you mean by that and, and how that integrates into uh, mm -hmm. a really good strategic marketing plan. Yeah, I, um, I definitely think that there's a time and place that, and I don't think the personas are ever going to totally go away, but it's interesting how you, you know, traditionally we'll go through and say, okay, here's our key, um, who's our target audience. And then we, we develop her persona. Here's bubbly Brooke. And this is what she does and, <laughs> and what she is interested in and what she consumes. And I think that is perfect, but what do we want this person to ultimately do? Um, and I think by flipping that and thinking, what is the outcome that we're trying to get? Are we trying to get them to enroll in a subscription? Are we trying to get them to purchase a service or download something? What is the outcome versus trying to say, okay, because Brooke likes X, Y, Z, this is how I'm going to talk to her. No, that comes into play of where we're going to place our advertisements, but the messaging needs to be thinking and focused on what is the outcome that I need Brooke to do in order for us to hit our objectives. And so I think it's just a small mindset shift. Um, and maybe it's just a vernacular thing to be honest, but I just find that asking the client that question gives them a little bit more to think about versus, oh, it's a, you know, female in her forties who consumes X, Y, Z. So, but, but let's say the outcome is I'm trying to sell, you know, I want people to buy more product. Simple mm -hmm. as that. I want pe yep. the outcome is I want people to buy more product. Well, how does mm -hmm. that just, just tell me again how yeah. that shapes the difference, the different thinking, give me mm -hmm. perhaps. Yeah. Even a bit of an example. And I think too, so it kind of goes back to your uh, brand and performance marketing. So if the outcome is I want to, I want them to buy more of this widget, I'm trying to think, okay, yes, I use their demographic and psychic psychographic information to figure out where they are. But then if I want them to purchase, what is the motivation um, that I can use to inspire mm -hmm. that um, messaging? 
And if it's not like, hey, check us out, it is very much a strong call to action of purchase um, that shapes your messaging as well. So if the outcome is purchase, I need to be very direct. I find that lead generation marketing uh, messaging is much different than brand messaging. So I've always had to push writers that I've worked with to say, let's be less conceptual and let's be very um, direct as to what we want them to do. And, you know, purchase is a short term action. Like we need to get them to purchase. And so let's not, you know, be clever or cute with the messaging. Whereas building a brand, we might need to, you know, have a longer form message and it basically changes the tactics that you use as well. So there must be times to stick to the basics and make sure you're getting it right. And I guess that's that 70% of your budget mm-hmm. where you're going for what you will already have learned with previous clients, what you know about the market. Mm-hmm. Uh, are there any other basics that you should be considering or um, what's part of that basic mix? You know, yeah. what do you see as, as the basics? I, I guess it very much depends on, on the, on the client and the service and the product, mm-hmm. but, but, where do you, where, where's the most of the money spent? Um, so I would say most of the money spent in, in my experience with the clients that I've worked with has been in digital. That was where a majority of the, the dollars were spent. But, you know, I've worked with uh, clients in the home services industry. Um, and then you diversify that digital spend into things like home advisor or Angie's list or things like that. Um, whereas a client that is in the tax preparation industry, that's obviously not where we're going to spend our dollars. But, um, you know, digital and traditional um, are synonymous now. I come from, you know, 20 years ago when I was at that ad agency, traditional was radio, TV and print. And now you throw digital in, digital and traditional. I don't even know that those words, (laughs) you know, are, are really that much different now. So the, it is very much a who's the client, what's their objectives and what's their industry when you look at what that mix is. But as I um, said earlier, that 70% really needs to look at what have we done in the past that has yielded good results and what do we, how do we need to optimize to maybe get a quarter percent more out of it? Or how can we, you know, plus that up a little bit to get, you know, even 5% more out of our efforts? It's worth mentioning that you have your own uh, blog, uh, which mm-hmm. is a uh, Brook on the Grow, uh, all yeah. the lessons on the road that you've yeah. learned. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, it's quite a personal blog. Uh, you you um, you have a passion around uh, health and wellness. What's mm-hmm. tell me more about tell me more why you have the what, what's that to do with? What's the yeah. passion there? Yeah, I think just stemming from childhood and playing sports. And when I got to college, I wasn't, I wasn't an athlete that was going to get recruited by any, you know, division one school by any stretch. But when I got to college, I realized my, my identity was wrapped around the team sports. I loved the, the participatory aspect of it and I was missing that. And so I really started getting into just working out for health um, while I was in college. And that has extended all the way through, you know, decades of my life where it's just very much part of who I am. It makes me feel better. I love talking about it with other individuals. Um, I love just living that lifestyle because it, I feel like makes me a better marketer. It makes me a better sister and um, dog mom. So it's just, it's just something that I kind of um, stumbled upon and I really enjoy. And I'm very much of the mindset that you need to do what you find fulfilling. And it's something that just, you know, I'm not doing it for an aesthetic purpose. I'm doing it for how it makes me feel about myself. And that's a, a growth area of your uh, mm-hmm. your work right now in, in mm-hmm. the uh, health and wellness space. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, so I'm going to finish on, if you had, uh, you know, a, a small budget mm-hmm. um, and you needed to cut costs, mm-hmm. wh- where do you focus? What do you, wh- where's the instinctive, how, what, how do you decide where to put the money? And, mm-hmm. and how to spend the money and 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 perhaps it's a process perhaps it's it's that understanding of the outcome it's that research um, mm-hmm. but I'm wondering if there's any any little nuggets that we've missed yeah. along the way in terms of really trying to get to to grips of a small budget mm-hmm. right let's focus that's, here yeah that's a great question and this is going to be a very tactical answer and may not be applicable for every industry but I'm going to use the example and what I've coached my franchisee clients on, um, my franchisor clients on, is looking at from a 
lead generation perspective, because most of the businesses are in um, a position where they're trying to generate sales or leads that will turn into sales. And so I just create this simple matrix. Um, I just draw like four quadrants on a piece of paper and I have your high cost per lead and high conversion in one corner. I have high cost per lead, low conversion rate. Then I have low cost per lead, low conversion rate, low cost per lead, high conversion rate. And so you start to plot that through. So if you're faced with, okay, we have a $5,000 budget a month and I need to cut it down to 3000 what are we going to cut? I'm going to look at the data first and see, okay, what's costing me the most money and not giving me the best return? That's probably going to be uh, something that I'm going to look at first. Um, and also, you know, where are we getting the best return for our buck? Maybe that's where we keep spending money, but it's really looking at that evaluation and what's going to continue to keep us marching towards the business objectives. And sometimes it's unfortunate that you have to cut, but I'm never recommending that you go completely dark on marketing because you need to still, you know, have a presence, have people be able to find you. I think there's ways that you can get really creative in stretching the dollars. And sometimes it's just maybe, changing the messaging a little bit or getting a little scrappier, doing some grassroots. There's always PR efforts. There's a lot of things that you can do um, that, you know, doesn't require completely shutting off your marketing spend. I like the scrappy testing and trying. Mm -hmm. um, it's very clear if you're a sunscreen brand, don't go out <laughs> there and create condom style packages with right. protect your skin on uh, right. It's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Brooke, this has been absolutely brilliant. Uh, you've made us uh, think in terms of um, failing. Failing's a good mm -hmm. thing. Failing's it a good is. thing because that's the only way we learn, isn't it? It's, it's the only uh, way we grow, yeah, too. Yeah. Uh, so tell us if people are interested in talking to you. We've got the um, your website, which is the, uh, the Grow CMO. We've got Brooke mm -hmm. on the Grow. But where do you hang out online if someone's wanting to contact you? What's the best place to find you? LinkedIn. I'm very, um, very vocal on LinkedIn. I'm very active. I have a newsletter. I post very often and I'm very real about my journey and, and being vulnerable about, you know, entrepreneurship, but then also sharing my opinions on brands, performance marketing and consumer research. So LinkedIn's the best place to find me. Brilliant. On that note, Brooke, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so much. If you've been watching, if you've been listening, we are very grateful that you've been here. This has been the Johnny Ross Fractional CMO, and we hope to see you soon. Take care.